Hey everyone, welcome to Being Well. I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the podcast, thanks for joining us today. And if you've listened before, welcome back. We recently released a couple of episodes focused on identifying and expressing our wants and needs to other people. And during those conversations, I mentioned that an important part of the process is developing a greater sense of self-worth. In addition to just feeling good, when we increase our self-worth, it allows us to get on our own side more easily, which can help us take our needs more seriously and change our lives for the better. And it's really easy to tell somebody to just develop some more self-worth, but it's often a lot harder to do it in practice. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today, how we can develop a more durable sense of self-worth. And to help us learn how to do that, I'm joined today, as usual, by Dr. Rick Hansen. Rick is a clinical psychologist, a best-selling author, and he's also my dad. So dad, why do you think that self-worth is so important? It's really hard to take action on our own behalf if we don't feel that we're worth the results, right? Right from the start. Second, low self-worth is uh, associated, as a lot of research shows, with depressive mood. So when you feel like you're running on empty, uh, because you don't feel much sense of worth, it's really hard to uh, you know keep on going. And then third, when other people bump into us, if you don't feel like you have much worth, it's, it's hard to bounce back from that. And it's hard to challenge other people who've been mistreating you and uh, even pursue assertiveness, reasonable assertiveness with them over time. The last thing I'll just say is that apart from all those kind of functional explanations. As a person who entered adulthood with really low self-worth, very low self-worth, and it's been a lifelong journey for me, actually, to, to engage this, deep down, you know, in the core of your being, what's it feel like when you don't feel very good about yourself? When you don't really feel like a particularly good person, you don't feel very lovable, very worthy of love, feels really, really crummy. At the bottom of low self-worth is a lie. Mm. Lies that other people told you and lies that maybe today you're continuing to tell yourself. And it's really unfortunate that those lies can cast such a long shadow. So Forrest, I'm so glad that you foregrounded this topic and we're going to get into it. Yeah, I think that was a great summary for Starter's Dad for why we're talking about this in the first place and why it's an important thing for people to yeah. um, focus on in their own lives. And whenever you start talking about something like self-worth, there are two families of questions that show up really quickly often for people. The first is, well, how is this different from other similar topics like self-esteem or self-confidence? And the second one that sometimes shows up for people is if I develop more self-worth, isn't that just going to turn me into like a malignant narcissist and I'm going to start kind of being an asshole to everyone? Uh, and we're going to address both of those. <laughs> but I want to start with the second one first, Dad, uh, and give you an opportunity to reply to some of those like common criticisms that come up when people talk about developing more self-worth. It's been observed for a long time, and there's a, just a lot of psychological theory about this, including in early psychoanalysis, that people who present out in the world as you know, arrogant and top dog, very, very, very often, that's a compensation for feeling the opposite underneath it all, often rooted in being treated in opposite ways when they were young. A variation of that as a detail, we'll get into it. Um, Alice Miller really developed this notion. I kind of experienced it, some of it myself as a kid, where you grow up as a kid and you sort of get whipsawed between being put up on the pedestal one moment and then knocked down on the other. It would, be, it would be almost easier if you were always being knocked down, at least you'd kind of see what's happening, or if you were always put up on the pedestal. But to have both of them happening can be really confusing to a kid, and you can kind of fight desperately to stay up on that pedestal, and you start to mm -hmm. really fear any lapse or any revelation of anything inside you that would lead others, including maybe your parents or your older sibling or kids at school, whack to knock you back down again. Yeah, is that is kind of similar to the uh, idealization devaluation yeah. pattern that we've talked about a little bit on the podcast? Yeah, cool. Super well said. Idealize you up, devalue you down. 
And yeah. uh, people who are uh, vulnerable to low self-worth, around which may well be an act, a kind of shell of pretentiousness and being impressive. You know, one of the things that tends to drive that is uh, a deep fear of being devalued, sometimes accompanied with preemptive strikes of devaluing others first. What we present to the world is often a compensation for what we feel inside. So therefore, the paradox is when people feel truly worthy inside, when they feel truly lovable, when they truly feel comfortable in their skin, then they don't have to keep proving it. They don't have to keep impressing others, and they don't have to keep pushing others down to lift themselves up. Yeah, so in the process of talking about that, you mentioned some features of people who might tend to struggle a little bit with self-worth. And one of the things that you mentioned were uh, difficulties that people have in childhood sometimes with parents who maybe went through those cycles of idealization and then de devaluation with them. That's pretty common. And the research generally shows that self-worth is easiest to develop in childhood and, an and adolescence, which is no surprise to anybody. And it sort of supports these two main strategies, which is to provide kids with unconditional love and respect and positive regard. And then the second one is to give kids or adolescents the opportunity to experience success of different kinds. And those two things together tend to support self-worth. And this actually ties to a recent uh, conversation we had with Gabor Matei, who talked about how unconditional love is one of the needs that children have, to be valued just because they're a being rather than because of what they can do for other people. And that gets us into a little bit of a conversation about the differences between self-worth and related things like self-esteem, that what you can do is often a bit more tied to self-esteem, whereas who you are is often a bit more tied to self-worth. Self-esteem is generally framed as how you feel about yourself and the opinions that you have about yourself. And where do our opinions about ourselves come from? Well, most of the time they come from other people. They come from the world around us. And a lot of what influences that is our evaluation of ourself relative to others. And this to me is a little bit different from self-worth, which is more the internal sense of being good enough just as you are. And it's right there in the word, right? It's the sense of being worthy. And my sense personally with my self-esteem is that it can really fluctuate on a moment to moment basis. It's really possible for me to feel good about myself in a moment while not having a really durable sense of self-worth. And I think that like you, Dad, when I was younger, my self-worth was more in question, but my self-esteem might have been quite high from moment to moment. Uh, does that kind of make sense? It does, and it reminds me of clients I have, I've had who really could come in with a master's thesis on their positive qualities, who deep down still felt bad about themselves. Deep down inside, there was a sense of shame, and low self-worth and shame tend to really go together. Around it was that shell that rationally, they knew they were talented, intelligent, they'd accomplished a lot, uh, but deep down inside, they still did not feel very good about themselves, and they did not enter into um, the next interaction with much confidence that, others would see their worth. Both self-esteem and self-worth, but a, a lot self-worth, is socially situated. Uh, yeah. Lizards don't struggle with low self-worth. <laughs> <laughs> They're not social creatures. It's, yeah. it's mammals. They just are. Yeah. In, including uh, primates. Uh, and you can see behaviors in mm. our primate cousins, like chimpanzees, let's say, uh, even rats, who in, in the experiment, let's say, the what will be constructed is a, is a kind of social insult. They will be devalued socially and as a manipulation. And then you watch what they do. And often what they'll do is they'll go off and pick on another rat or another monkey that they're dominant toward in the larger hierarchy. You mentioned earlier on in the episode, Dad, that you were somebody where you would self-describe as having some struggles with self-worth personally. Mm -hmm. And then as time has gone on, you've achieved a more durable sense of that. And uh, so maybe to ask an overly simple question here, what did you do? That's really great. 
it lets me make another point too, which is that I think people can err too far on either side. Like for example, the history of the self-esteem construct is connected a lot to the psychologist Nathaniel Brandon, yeah. who is situated a lot in individualism and somewhat libertarian adjacent. He was a early student and protege of Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand, and you know, there's a whole backstory there. So we have that sense of at one end we can develop self-esteem and self-worth in a very individualistic disengaged from others way. That said, especially when we're young, the development of self-esteem and self-worth is highly socially valenced. It's very related to our relationships. And often interactions that are not explicitly about worth are still very consequential. For example, just being listened to and is, is a communication of the worth of the child even if the parent is not particularly praising the child in the moment or saying, oh, gee, wonderful painting, you know, just great, the best ever, better than Picasso, right? The parent is just listening. But that sense of others being present with you and their attention is a validation of your own worth. So for me, you know, in my journey, um, in loving, in a loving, decent family and a reasonable environment, it wasn't that I got a lot of devaluing coming my way, mm -hmm. although my parents were quite critical. It's that there was an absence, a lack mm. of um, being interpersonally received by others, even without praising. And then also definitely a lack of in inclusion and, and valuing among my peers. And I'm saying the details of this to kind of broaden the notion. You don't have to grow up in a family in which you're shamed every day to walk out of that family with this deep down emptiness inside and uncertainty about whether you're any good or anyone mm. will ever really want you. you know? mm. So then we're in the healing journey, but I wanted, you know, I could summarize that kind of briefly. I just took in the good relentlessly. Starting at about 16 mm. when I landed in college, I realized that I had this huge hole in my heart um, and that I could help myself a few times every day by looking for evidence of my worth that mm -hmm. people would want me to come over and sit with them at the you know table in the cafeteria, that a girl would smile at me in the elevator, you know, an older student, uh, like a junior quarterback on our intramural football team, uh, you know, who was a serious, excellent athlete, would grunt to me as he passed by one day <laughs> in a very guyish way, Hanson, you're good. I'm going to throw to you more. And I felt like the heavens had parted. <laughs> Man, I really took that one in. I, mean, I, I milked that one for months afterward. <laughs> and, just, and I think this path is super hopeful for us. You know, to take the actions that put you in situations where you can be with people who are not devaluing, who are receptive and present with you and include you and, you know, reasonably acknowledging um, and do things which help yourself shine a little bit or accomplish things that are then worthy of acknowledgement or inclusion. Um, and however it all happens, really, really take it in. Really, really mm -hmm. take it in when it comes your way. Do you think that you had, um, I didn't really expect the episode to go this way, so, but I'm just going to keep on using you as a proxy here for the audience. I, were, if you I don't worked mind, on Dad, you a couple episodes ago. It's so true. It's, it's true. It's true. It's true. You, it's you massaged me with the dog story. <laughs> so now we're going to kind of put the shoe on the other foot here. Um, do you think that you had specific struggles with like, I'm trying to find the right way to say this. I, I guess that in my experience, and I can just kind of unpack this with you. Uh, people who struggle with self-worth, and I would put myself in this category, just tend to be extremely self-critical. Um, often unreasonably self-critical based on whatever is is going on around them, right? And there's some there's some space for reasonable self-criticism in life. You know, we need to be able to take a step back sometimes and go, hey, you know, that wasn't in line with your values or, oh, you really could be doing something a little bit differently inside of this relationship. But by and large, 90 plus percent of the time for people, uh, their self-criticism outstripes their ability to build themselves up and, and have enough self-compassion. And I just wonder if that was a feature for you, because I've always thought of you as being quite you know, supportive of yourself, but that's just in the time that I've known you for, which is basically the last 30 years. 
This is great. I, I'm getting yeah. more out of this than a lot of therapy appointments <laughs> I had back in the day. This is great. The, the the best compliment I ever got from a guest on the podcast, I was I was interviewing somebody. You actually weren't there for this one. They were a therapist themselves, and we got to the end of the interview, and they are like, wow, Forrest, I feel like I just had like a really good session there. That was great. I was like, that was not my intent. I'm not a clinician, but I was, took it as a very high compliment. Oh, that's really great. Yeah. Conversations can be therapeutic with yeah. people who do not have a professional license as a therapist. Totally. Well, it's a very interesting question. Um, a common model that we've talked about of the psyche is to think of it in three parts. So there's the inner being, and then there's the critical aspects, and then there are the supportive aspects, or the inner attacker, inner nurturer, and kind of beleaguered self. And you're right. I think for many people, their low self-worth is related to uh, a very dominant inner attacker, which is often the internalization of external attackers or critics they experienced in their life, as particularly as a kid. For me, I don't think I developed a big inner attacker, partly because my parents, who you met, are, are really sweet people, were sweet people, who were fussing a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and they were kind of fault finding, and they were anxious. You know, they they grew up in the depression. They 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 grew up in a lot of difficulty, yeah, and they just wanted. Context. They loved me and my siblings, and they wanted to keep us alive and well. Safe. Okay, yeah, totally. But but pretty early, and here's what's interesting, is that I realized that they were crazy. I wasn't crazy. Mm. And there's a fateful choice that many kids make. They're they're crazy or you're crazy or you know they're they're neurotic or you're neurotic or something like that and most kids make the understandable but wrong choice which goes to the lie that I started with that the fault is over here rather than over there and I don't know what enabled me at age six to have a crystal clear highly memorable experience in which I just became super clear that the sources of unhappiness in my family were not inside me. I wasn't making it. They were making it. And they weren't bad. I, I still love my parents um, and loved in the past sense, but I was really clear. There was a differentiation. So if you're listening to this, you might rewind your own childhood and recognize perhaps you made those differentiations too, or maybe recognize that, you know, like most people, I think I was lucky in some ways, uh, but like most people, maybe you didn't make that differentiation and you took on board that there was something wrong with you when actually there was something wrong with the system you were in. Now, what made that system wrong was probably reached probably way past your parents, their parents and their parents' parents and the culture, the economic forces, the roles of gender, race, socialization, social class, all kinds of stuff. But bottom line, the system, there was something wrong with the system. There was never anything wrong with you. Imagine rewinding your history and going back retroactively and letting that land and talking with the you you were way back when in first grade to really help that part of you that's still a layer of your psyche today to realize, wow, what was wrong was outside me. There was nothing wrong inside me. Right? That's really important. And to finish though, even though there was a, not a, for various reasons, not a dominating inner attacker that was this huge, harsh superego in Freudian language or you know, punishing internalized parent in other languaging, there was a very meek and small inner nurturer. I didn't have much of an inner nurturer. And for all kinds of reasons, including the lack of those nurturing supplies coming to me that were um, uncompromised. Most of the nurturance that came my way was compromised by criticism that was you know, woven into it. And, um, and also I just got increasingly withdrawn, so the actual nurturance that was there, I, I kind of turned away from or didn't even notice. So that too is something for people to think about. And I actually have found that um, while it's important to stand against an overly powerful inner attacker, where the great opportunity is for most people 
day by day, you know, one experience at a time, one synapse at a time, one drop at a time, is to fill their bucket and grow inner nurturers, which then over time can be a bulwark inside you against the power of the inner attacker. Just out of curiosity, Dad, when you have gone through that process in a variety of different ways of building up more of the nurturing parts of yourself, and you, you've written about this extensively in a variety of different books. We've talked about it on the podcast. Uh, when I do that with myself, it is almost always in like an IFSE sort of framework where I think about the parts of myself that need support. And often these parts are are younger or more vulnerable parts. I mean, younger both conceptually, like how I how I think of them as being a young person and also younger in terms of that's generally when we have these painful experiences that come mm -hmm. to uh, cause a wound to self-worth in some way. They tend to happen when people are younger. They don't have to, but they tend to. Is that a process that you ever did with yourself? Like it, speaking to a younger part of yourself, you talk about a part of you that's like six years old that had this moment of knowing, um, or I don't know, were these parts more early teenage years? I don't know, however you want to unpack that question, just a personal curiosity. Yeah. It's such a rare blessing to be able to have this conversation between a parent and a kid, isn't oh, it? Yeah. Both ways. Totally. Yeah. Uh, well, I ha I you know, I'm I came up through the human potential movement in the sixties and the seventies, and there was a lot of parts work back then. So parts work, uh, you know, is embedded it's in psychoanalysis. If you think of the tripartite structure of id, ego, superego, and then you think Jungians, Jung's elaborations, and then the Neo-Jungians with the gods within, women who run with wolves, you know, all, all kinds of stuff like that. Hillman, James Hillman, and so forth. And then you have the Gestalt, and then you have voice dialogue. A lot of stuff going on. So yeah, uh, parts work. Uh, one of the key ways I did parts work with myself was to imagine uh, a extremely young, like a one-year-old, uh, or even seven month old, being in a crib, being hungry, calling out, no one coming. And then I would, which probably happened when I was a kid because I was fed on a schedule like babies in the 50s, right? Often were uh, uh, by well intended parents who thought that was how to do it. Yeah. So that's just what people said to do. Yeah. But I would imagine a nurturing figure coming to me, kind of ambiguous coming in terms of gender mm -hmm. or identity, but coming to me and helping me and caring for me. That kind of inner work, I definitely worked that a lot. A lot, though, when you're asking me about the internalization, uh, when you feel cared about, when you feel like you matter enough for another person to really give you their attention, the feeling of it is the gold. That's the super medicine. It's helpful to have proper concepts about your value, but they're pretty conceptual, and often they sit on top of underlying emotions and somatic markers in the body that uh, support an overall sense of low worth. And so for me, yeah. the real gold is, is actually very simple. It's kind of visceral. I'm not, I'm not that, when I'm doing this myself, to answer your question directly, I'm not that conceptual about it. I'm not mm -hmm. using, I know a lot <laughs> about this stuff. I'm not really bringing in my psychoanalytic understanding of totally. my, totally. you know, the multi, the, yeah. all the multiple yeah. personalities sure. around the table. I'm just marinating in this golden experience of feeling included, seen, of value, uh, or independent of any social referent. In an interesting way, when you know that you're good inside, you feel particularly appalled when you act badly. <laughs> Paradoxically, when you really feel good inside, it tends to just naturally draw you upward on the high road, rather than help making you complacent and callous toward other people. Or turning you into a pain in the ass to be around, as we were talking about at the very beginning of the episode there. Yeah. So we've slid very naturally here into talking about some of the things that people can do to cultivate a greater feeling of self-worth. A few that we've basically already named are finding ways to develop more self-compassion, feeding the inner nurturer, being thoughtful about feeding the inner critic too much, 
maybe alongside that, doing a little unpacking of your childhood, which is something that we've talked about virtually every episode of the podcast. So yeah. we're probably sounding a bit like a broken record, but I do think that it is really central here. Um, certainly for me, uh, providing a feeling of nurturance toward a, a younger part in both a conceptual and in a very, as you were speaking, like felt sense of that being kind of way mm -hmm. um, was very powerful for me personally. Yeah. Because I think that when we have a lack of self-worth, sometimes it's that the wholeness of us has a lack of self-worth, and sometimes it's that some core aspect of identity does not feel valued by the rest of the system for what it is. And there's something about that that's just been very helpful for me to realize that there were aspects of myself that did not feel valued by the rest of the system. And that's why I was struggling with self-worth in a variety yeah. of different ways. So like deliberately going out of your way to kind of apply value to those parts can be very helpful, or at least it was for me personally. I've co-signed that, really underlined okay. that, and I, you know, I've definitely done that. And I've actually done funny dialogues. Psychosynthesis is another wonderful tradition that, that explores this kind of thing. and. One thing you can kind of do is imagine a three-part dialogue. So you have the inner, the beleaguered self or the inner child, the wounded part, let's say. And then you have the, let's, some form of inner attacker and inner nurturer. To your point, it's often helpful to differentiate the elements of the attacker committee and the nurturing committee or the caring committee I talk about. Like for example, the attacker committee can have an element that is could be called the pusher, the part that just pushes us beyond uh, our endurance. Sometimes, you know, it doesn't really care how we feel; it just says you've got to keep going, you got to keep going. Then there might be a part that is the doubter, like, well, how do you know? Like, did they really mean it? But you'll get up. You might make a mistake the next time. They're just casting doubt. Right? They're not critical per se, they're just casting doubt. And then you might have a part that could be an internalization of a religious history, kind of a fire and brimstone, finger wagon. You're a sinner, you were born in sin, you are a sinner. So you know, it's kind of helpful sometimes to differentiate voices, inner voices, subpersonalities. You know, can, it can help you feel less overwhelmed by them to differentiate mm -hmm. that. I just kind of want to drop that in. These parts or these self-critical aspects or, uh, you know, whatever it is that's kind of preventing us from accessing a, a more consistent feeling of self-worth and feeling worthy just as we are, are often based on stories that we tell ourselves of different kinds. And one of the most useful practices I've ever gone through personally is, is a deliberate process of investigating some of those negative stories that those more critical parts are often based on. And the first step in this is you just identify what the story is, right? Maybe like you were saying, dad, somebody has a story that um, maybe I did it right this time, but I'm gonna mess it up the next time. You know, that was luck. I am what I am. You know, things are gonna turn out poorly for me at the end of the day because that's what happens to me. Well, that's a pretty powerful negative story, and it, you could see how that could get really tied up in somebody's individual self-evaluing of self-worth, right? So we've identified that story, and then it's really, really helpful to be able to get a little bit of space from it, right? Like, these stories are who we are initially, and over time, we can kind of unpeel them so they're less who we are, and they're more just another part, just an idea, just a thought. And we can kind of hold them separate from us and take a look at them with a more investigating frame of mind. And then you can go through a process with them. You can ask the, the story to validate itself. You could say, what's the evidence here? Um, and then alongside that, like, what's the evidence against? And then once you've gone through that, maybe the, maybe it's gotten a little frayed or maybe it's gotten even tighter and it's, and it's widening and your attachment to it, whatever. A really, really powerful question to ask in my experience is, where does this story come from? And who gave this story to me? Um, because kids aren't just lumps of clay. There is some underlying nature that we do tend to carry around. But most of these stories found their origins somewhere. And it generally wasn't in us just waking up one day and deciding that there was this fundamental problem with us. 
it normally comes from the outside. It comes from parents, social environment, culture, all those things you named earlier, Dad. And a lot of the time, there are people who are benefited by having us believe that thing. Or us believing that thing is in alignment with what somebody else wants us to do or to think. And it can be really helpful as an adult to go back through and be like, wait a second, who told me this? And why should I believe it? Like, is it in service to me to believe it? Or if I believed something else, would I be happier? Would I be more fulfilled? Would I feel more worthy? Totally great. And there, one mm. practical application of that is to write letters to yourself. Yeah, great. And you, you don't need to make it a big production, but to write letters and you, including maybe just thinking about different key ages. Uh, you know, just when I think about, you know, I could have sure used a letter then <laughs> from the time machine <laughs> <laughs> from Forrest. I'll get you to write me a letter, you know, from the future. Love right? it, yeah. But man, the me I was, gosh, um, in high school, uh, the me I was when I first started to become kind of feeling particularly awkward and shy right around third grade or so, and then onward. Uh, the me I was, you know, my early 20s, uh, the me I was just thrashing my way through grad school, uh, scratching and clawing my way to a license, uh, which, you know, I earned or got just before my 40th birthday. And, you know, then I had to keep going from there. You know, man, I could have used some of those letters. So that's something mm. people can do for themselves. Two things strike me that are, as we talk, Forrest, and I, I want to get your take on them. We're describing, in a sense, actions we could take to, yeah. mm -hmm. it's almost uh, put modules or building blocks of self-worth and self-esteem inside ourselves. Sure. Yeah. Okay. That's, and there's really a great place to mm -hmm. do that. You know. Totally. Okay. Yep. I'm thinking about two sorts of things that can naturally sift down, as it were, like a golden mm -hmm. rain sift down inside us uh, with a little fairy dust of uh, <laughs> self-worth sinking deep down inside. <laughs> Very poetic, Dad. Okay, keep going. Okay, something. Uh, and one of them is to have conversations with people in which there's a lot of mutual rapport. Yeah, totally. And deep down in early childhood, it's those interactions in which there's a lot of mutual rapport that naturally leave residues behind of worth in the young child. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. interactions in which there's a breach of rapport, misattunement, gears grinding, that leave young children with low worth. This primal experience of low worth, subordination, and shame is the consequence of a breach of appropriate empathic rapport. And so the opposite is also true. In interactions in which there's a lot of mutuality and rapport, we have opportunities to feel good about ourselves, which then it's important to take in and not waste them on the brain and to work with the maybe parts inside you that say, no, you're not allowed to do that. So I just, that, that's one. And I'll just throw out another and ask you about it, whether, yeah. whether you experience the golden fairy dust yourself, which is, <laughs> Uh, being loving yeah, and being rested in loving, not caretaking in any way that's exhausting, right? But just feeling a lovingness flowing through you. I think that too is an opportunity to, to, to receive this golden fairy dust as it were of, you know, bit by bit, uh, self-worth by self-worth. And it's particularly helpful when a person feels like they're not receiving that much love or validation or value, you know, support from others, maybe because that there isn't much really for all kinds of reasons, but that person still has the power to be loving themselves in with all kinds of benefits, including the benefit of the opportunity to develop a greater sense of worth. What do you think of those two? This gets to something that I've been talking uh, with Elizabeth about a lot recently. And Elizabeth's my partner, by the way, if you're new to listening to the podcast. Uh, and she is currently in her associateship. She's training to be a therapist. And so she's graduated from her school. And now she's in the process of working with people in the crewing hours. And so the big old question, why does therapy work? 
Like, wh- why can't you just think your way into a better way of being? Why do you have to do it in front of another person? Hmm, really interesting question, right? So there are two explanations for that. The first is therapist as teacher. The therapist imbues you with the knowledge that you need about yourself. And the second big possibility is the uh, therapist as loving supporter of you. And the first version of this is a little bit more kind of Freudian or behaviorist influence, so on. And the uh, second version of it is a bit more humanistic psychology, Carl Rogers and things like that. Um, Loosely grouping these into two groups with a lot of fuzziness in between the two of them. Uh, And most clinicians these days probably have a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. And the answer is probably some combination of both. Uh, But my personal view is I think it's more B than A. And I think that most of our growth takes place relationally. And uh, it creates a kind of funny double bind for us on the podcast where I really like focusing, kind of like you were saying, Dad, in what can we really do on our own with our own brain? Because I know that everyone listening to this podcast, or 99% of the people listening to this podcast, can do those things on their own with their own brain. But I don't know what they have access to socially. And a lot of people don't have access socially to some of the experiences that would actually be most healing for them. But I think that end of the day, yeah, we're relational beings. We're social animals. And so much of identifying our own self-worth comes from two places. And they're the two that you named. And the first one is, can we feel loved by others? And the second one is, can we feel like we love others? And uh, yeah, I think that those are maybe the two fundamental drivers of self-worth in addition to the other things that we've named. So that was a bit of a spiel. What do you think about all of that? Well, I, I, (laughs) so much in what you said there. And and I, 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 what I've observed is that there are multiple paths into developing self-worth and uh, many of them certainly, especially when we're young, involve other people. To, to be sure. In addition to that, I can think of many, uh, I can think of several major pathways of, to develop a sense of worth that are really not uh, socially referenced. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 No, I'm just saying that, like, um, because the social aspect of this is yeah. so literally built into us in yeah. terms of like our, our, our group structure as big primates, yeah. um, that is a major source for people. Really valid. And uh, I would name like maybe three things that just kind of flag for people as an opportunity maybe. Um, first of three is to just develop and notice that you have and are developing competencies of various kinds. Yeah, you're able. You know how to do stuff. And kind of related to that, I'll make a distinction between talents and skills. You can recognize that you have certain talents that are innate, and then you can also recognize that you've developed some skills, both of which are, in effect, kinds of competencies. A second, yeah, yeah, um, is a sense of agency. I'm playing one of your songs here in the podcast. Love it, great song. And it could be agency really independent of other people, just the sense that, Yeah. yeah, I can make stuff happen in some ways. And to build up that sense of agency is helpful. Then third is um, actualizing different capacities. Uh, Yeah. Uh, And, you know, doing, making art, making music, making dance. Uh, I think that too tends to just the fact that we're, we're using ourselves and we're being used in good ways can also build up a sense of worth. Yeah, totally. And I think that it's great that you're flagging things there that aren't sociable in nature and they're accessible to just about everyone, right? And we can feel competent in a lot of different ways to just flag one that you you mentioned for a second there. So this doesn't necessarily have to be becoming a really high achiever at something that can get tied up to some problematic versions of self-esteem. You can feel competent while you do the dishes. Um, so this doesn't have to be tied to these like big aspirational things. It can just be very much a day-to-day experience. And I want to loop back to something that you said, I want to say maybe like 20 or 30 minutes ago, Dad, where you mentioned that like a lizard doesn't question its own self-worth. 
right? But as you said, we're social animals. And so part of what leads to us having questions about our self-worth is that kind of wounding that can emerge inside of our social relationships for people. And I think that a real way that's available for people, but is very hard to kind of slice the whole Gordian knot does relate to a certain kind of, maybe it's more contemplative practice or it's more mindfulness practice or however you want to talk about it here, where you're increasingly getting a sense for how just like the lizard is and therefore does not really question whether or not it's worthy. It's worthy by virtue of the fact that it is you can relate to yourself increasingly in that kind of a way. And we often take the worth of those other things very much for granted, at least in my experience. I don't have self-worth questions about uh, the worthiness of the various plants that you know Elizabeth has around the apartment. But I can have real questions about the worthiness of myself. Mm. And that's really interesting, right? It's like we're holding ourselves to some kind of other standard that we're not applying to other beings. And... I definitely haven't gotten to this place, but I've interacted with people who feel like they've gotten to a place where those self-worth questions become almost kind of hard to understand because it's just so inherently clear that they are and therefore they are worthy. And as somebody who's interacted with this a lot more than I have, Dad, do you have anything to add to that? It's very deep. Um, so first, just a anecdote some people may know, uh, when the Dalai Lama initially started coming to the West and teaching 20-some plus years ago, I believe, uh, I think it was Sharon Salzberg, who's a mindfulness teacher and who, interestingly, had really is, is an historic figure in pushing forward the dimension of compassion and kindness into what was often presented as a fairly austere, heady Buddhistiness you know, as it kind of came to the West. So so she asked the Dalai Lama in a conference, you know, uh, a lot of people in the West hate themselves. And what could you offer to them? The Dalai Lama actually had to stop and talk to his translator for apparently a minute or two just to clarify that, that what, Sharon, what Sharon had asked, because he couldn't believe it at first. He almost didn't have the words in Tibetan, like, what? Hate yourself? What? And then he responded in ways that were really quite kind and tender. I don't know the exact details, but ultimately pointed to uh, the importance of feeling basically good about yourself as a foundation for practice, including a practice that really aims at enlightenment, ultimately, in this life or a future one. Uh, and uh, he just really was troubled and puzzled by what is it about Western culture that this could happen in a way that to him is, was really foreign to his own cultural background. So there is certainly a place, even if as we are engaged at, in you know, moving toward the upper reaches even of human potential, that it's really important to bring yourself along, <laughs> to, to, to help yeah, yourself sure. feel okay as who you are along the way in a, in a kind of bone-deep way. So I think that's kind of a part one here. And part two is what you're getting at, which is that uh, as the sense of identity starts to shift, the first of the two words in that key phrase, self-worth, starts to fade away. And the sense of there being some kind of an entity inside who is the single, unified, always the same, independent entity inside you, that starts to break up. You start to realize that through parts work that that so-called entity is much more like a complicated, messy village with many characters running around and coming and going, really, to, you know, rising and, you know, increasing and decreasing based on all kinds of forces and conditions. And the sense of self starts to really, really ease. And, and more and more, the, 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 you know, the psychological matter of personal worth starts becoming increasingly irrelevant as you genuinely start having your identity feel more distributed, more embedded, 
in reality altogether and more rested in beingness. And as that actually happens in a genuine way, um, you know, then then uh, the the preoccupation with oneself, the uh, old issues of low worth, start to become increasingly dissolved mm-hmm. in that mm-hmm. larger whole. Yeah. Well, that was great. It was a very deep reflection to end this episode on, uh, but we really kind of wandered into the <laughs> wandered into the real stuff here, Dad. I mean, as as is often the case, you know, you throw some of this on a page in our little show planning document, yeah. and it can feel kind of sterile. And uh, then you actually talk about it, and it really goes somewhere, and it goes somewhere very interpersonal. And uh, I found it personally useful. I hope people listening did as well. I think that most of the stuff that we talk about on the podcast has its foundation somewhere in there in this question. Like, do you think that you are a basically good enough person who is worthy as you are? Because from there, you can do all sorts of things to face challenges, get on your own side, deal with problems, care about your own growth, all of that. But if you don't feel that way, it's hard to access anything else that we talk about on this show or that you know people offer as ways to like grow and change over the course of a life. So I think it's just such a fundamental topic and I'm glad we talked about it today. Oh, I'm hugely glad. And if I may just add one last little thing, which is that most of us are not rested most of the time <laughs> in that sense of universal being. Sure, and yeah. Most I'm of the time, not. yeah, uh, me included. <laughs> some ways, uh, we're just very vulnerable. And I think one of the takeaways here is to give thought to how we land on others. Unwittingly, whatever it might be, our frustration, our exasperation, our criticism, our sense of pressure, we want this, why didn't you do that? Oh, we land on each other. And I think it's really helpful to, to have a kind of tenderness in our interactions with others. And I don't do that perfectly for sure. I'm a work in progress. I have a kind of tenderness that doesn't muzzle ourselves or walk on eggshells, but doesn't needlessly, needlessly injure the sense of worth in another person. And deliberately in ways that are authentic and not manipulative, not to give to get, just to give authentically look for the good in others and to keep communicating that felt recognition of the good in them to them as appropriate every day. Today I talked with Rick about how we can develop more self-worth and we began the conversation by exploring why having more self-worth is in general actually a good thing. And this might seem inherently obvious it feels better to feel like you matter than it does to feel like you don't. But a lot of the time when we have these conversations, people sail in with a lot of uh, critiques and questions related to, hey, if I feel more worthy, won't that kind of turn me into an unpleasant person to be around? Am I just going to transform into a narcissistic pain in the butt or something else? And while it's really understandable to have those kinds of questions, There's often this sort of paradox that appears in psychology and in people's behavior where when they feel really insecure internally, they act really grandiose externally. And when they actually feel truly worthy inside of themselves, it turns them into a nicer person externally as well. I went from there to asking Rick about what some of the common features are in people who struggle with self-worth. And no surprise, a lot of this can be traced back to our childhoods. He talked about cycles of idealization and devaluation, where on the one hand, a kid is pumped up by their parents, they're really put onto a pedestal. And then on the other hand, they're told over and over again that they will never be able to do it quite right, or, oh, this was so disappointing, you fell short of my expectations. There's a lot that can influence this, but the big point here is that people who struggle with self-worth in adulthood often faced some difficulties related to these topics in childhood. 
And we went from there to talking a little bit about what distinguishes self-worth from similar concepts like self-esteem and self-confidence. And it's common to have these phrases used interchangeably, particularly in more casual conversations about this topic. I thought it was kind of funny that the definition of self-worth is just another word for self-esteem, but I do think that there are some meaningful differences. Uh, self-esteem is typically framed as how we feel about ourselves and the opinion that we have about ourselves. And this is in turn heavily influenced by the opinions and feelings that other people have about us because we're big social animals. Whereas self-worth, on the other hand, is just the internal feeling of being good enough as you are, the feeling of being worthy, right? And you can imagine how somebody, and maybe think of yourself if this is true for you, could have pretty high self-worth, like a basic sense that, yeah, I am you know, a good and decent being who deserves to be here in this world, while in a specific moment, not having a lot of self-esteem, right? Feeling like you're really messed up, or oh my God, I did this all wrong, or whatever it is. But your self-worth isn't in question. And you can also think about it vice versa, which I think happens maybe even more frequently, uh, certainly for myself, where I have a question about my self-worth, but in a moment, my self-esteem is doing okay, maybe because I really accomplished something or I got a compliment and now I feel kind of puffed up around it, whatever it might be. And then I went from there to talking with Rick about his own journey with developing some self-worth, going from being a kid who did not have a very strong sense of self-worth inside to being somebody who really does feel good as they are. And we talked about some of the techniques he used to get from point A to point B, uh, how he had the fortunate experience when he was younger of being able to separate his own behavior from that of his broader family system. That was really helpful for him. And then as an adult, how he was able to go back and give some additional nurturance to that younger version of himself. This took us into a conversation about IFS and parts work, which then led to us talking about some general ways that people can improve their self-worth. Some of the practices that we named during this part of the conversation include things like developing more self-compassion, and really building up your inner nurturer inside. And in the same way, people can push back against their inner critic or maybe challenge some of the uh, negative stories about themselves that they've internalized. And then Rick really flagged a very important way that people can develop self-worth, which is in relationship. This could include really seeing yourself reflected in the eyes of somebody who cares about you or feeling into your own pro-social traits and the ways in which you're good to others. And this kind of took us into a little bit of a tangent where I talked about, you know, why therapy works and how a lot of our healing occurs in relationship and how sometimes I'm a little reticent on the podcast to talk about relationship-based interventions for problems because everybody's relationships are different. And I do know at the end of the day that there's a lot that people can do inside of their own mind that's accessible to almost everybody who listens to the podcast, but I don't know what the nature of somebody's relationships are. And Rick followed up on this by pointing to all of the ways that somebody could develop more self-worth without having to rely on our networks of relationship around us. And one of the things that he mentioned as an example of this was getting a sense of our competencies, feeling really good at different kinds of things. And then we used that as a jumping off point to talk about how we can lighten up about some of these questions altogether and ground into a deeper kind of sense that we're worthy just because we are, rather than because of what we are to other people. That's it for today's episode. If you've been enjoying the podcast, I'd really appreciate it if you would take a moment to subscribe to it wherever you're listening to it now on, and maybe even leave a rating and a positive review. That really helps us out. If you'd like to support us in other ways, you can find us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. And for just a few dollars a month, you can support the show and you'll get a bunch of bonuses in return. So until next time, thanks for listening and we'll talk to you soon.